Today, I'm gonna to be catching up with a very special guest and an old friend. We'll be talking about our three county breeds and also food provenance. Now, I was lucky enough to have been born and brought up in the Cotswold Hills. So I'm a Gloucestershire boy through and through. And the Cotswolds has so much to offer with its dry stone walls, its picturesque villages. We've got a cheese that we decided to roll down a hill, our mahogany colored cattle. We've got those fantastic orchard pigs. And of course, the Cotswold lion with its beautiful golden fleece. And the gentleman I'm meeting today is another British lion. He had a wonderful rugby career, a decade of playing for the Cherry and Whites at Gloucester. And then he had 73 games for England, one of which was when they won the World Cup back in 2003. It is, of course, the fantastic rugby player, the celebrity chef, Phil Vickery, and he's here now. Good to see you, old boy. You okay? Very well. You're looking well. Uh, and you? Oh, I don't know about that. Sun shining, happy farmer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when was the last time you were here, Phil? I think it was a good 10 years ago, Adam. I remember bringing my daughter here. Yeah, so um, things have moved on a bit. That's incredible. It's, uh, you invested a lot of money and time in here. Yeah, we have. So where did this actually all start from, your father? Yeah, so dad started it in 1971. So he took on the farm tenancy in 62, just had commercial sheep and cattle and the arable farm, but then collected rare farm animals, you know, like the Gloucester cattle yeah. and the Gloucester old squat pig. And then ended up with quite a large collection. And his business partner said to him, look, Joe, the reason these are rare is they're not commercially viable. They don't make any money. So what are we gonna do? And dad said, well, people go to zoos. Why don't they come to farms? And so got permission from the landlord, uh, got planning permission. And this was an old land that was sort of part of the farm that's hand quarried. You see, it's all lumpy yeah, and bumpy. Yeah, yeah. So it was quarried for roofing slates and walling stone. And so, so as you're driving around the Cotswold, you see the, like the Cotswold stone, you know, dry stone walls. That, that, that's where originally came from. Yeah. Dug by hand from the fields or picked up from the fields <laughs> <laughs> in the good old days. <laughs> And in the first year, back in 1971, it was 5p for children and 10p for adults to get in. <laughs> <laughs> we had, and we had 20,000 visitors and they suddenly realised they're onto a good thing. But it's great though, so you've got here rare breeds, not just from Gloucestershire, but from all around the country. So you take it on yourself to help promote and, and keep those rare breeds going. That's right, yeah. So we've got 50 different breeds of seven different species. And they're breeds that my dad collected years ago and then some new ones that we've added. And we work very closely with the Rare Breed Survival Trust. So dad was founder chairman of that in 1973. Prior to its formation, 26 different British breeds were lost, lost to extinction. So the sheeted Somerset cattle gone forever, the Lincolnshire curly coated pig gone forever and many others. But now we haven't lost any more since its formation, which I think is brilliant. And they were sort of rare breeds conservation, trying to hang on to those rare breeds. But now these animals have a purpose, a use, producing wool, milk, meat, you know, and that's the idea, giving them a purpose for the future of farming. Well, the way that I think about farming now, and, and yes, of course, you know, commercially, commercial animals are a different beast, but actually when we think now as a, so as a consumer, I start thinking about where my food comes from, what I like to eat, whether we're talking about grass fed, a lot of those native breeds are low maintenance, they don't take a huge amount out of our countryside. They don't take a huge amount of carbon footprint. And it's kind of, you are eating, for me, as natural and as good, a, a, whether that be a meat protein, whether that be a vegetable or a root vegetable or a pulse or a grain. And actually now we know science and sports science is telling us it's, it's good, it's better for you. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And it, and, it, yeah. And, it, and it lies with those historical breeds, which I think for me is fantastic. Well, you're in an amazingly unique position, aren't you, really? You know, you, you've had an incredible sports career. You know, you're very connected to the land because of your family farm in Cornwall. And then also, you're into nutrition and you're a chef. So <laughs> how did that all come together then, Phil? Well, I think, for me, food farming and rugby are all the same thing. Because when I started playing rugby down in Bude in North Cornwall, where my family farm is, pretty much everyone at the rugby club had something to do with farming. They were all my friends. And even, obviously I didn't start out to become World Cup winner, England captain, British and Irish Lion. I just wanted, I just fell in love with rugby, probably first and foremost, because it gave me a sense of purpose. 
So give me a sense of value. I wanted to represent my, you know, my local town. And I think then to, to bring it all through and to finish my career and the food thing, nutrition's a huge part of being a professional sportsman. I love cooking. Farmhouse at home growing up for me was nan cooking, pots of saffron, bun mix, pies, quiches, <laughs> tarts, pasties, yeah. you know, deep freezers outside, all brought outside. I was lucky I was surrounded by just great produce, but, but food was a huge part of life and I still love that today. And even being in restaurant at like number three, what do people say, what do you love about it? I kid you not, it was on last Thursday, I went to restaurants buzzing, people's families, occasions, birthdays, celebrations, memories, yeah. people coming together. What have we all really talked about, particularly in the last couple of years of all the chaos which is going around in the world at the moment? Friendships, relationships, yeah. people coming together, value, well-being. And to bring all that back into food, I know I'm not a professional sportsman anymore, and I don't want to be. But I know the biggest impact that I can have on my well-being and my body is what I put in me. Yeah, yeah. And if we can all just think a little bit more about that, I just that's the biggest impact that I know that, and I'm in complete control of that, and I'm bloody passionate about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you know. It, well, and, and me too. I mean, that you know, the landscape, the wildlife, the conservation, but also really good quality British farming. Oh yes, we do need local breeds. We do need to be more sustainable. We do need animals that can convert rough pasture into good quality beef and milk, and that's what these rare breeds are all about. Which is why we like to carry on the ethos of rare breeds conservation, but education is seeing young people. I was just going to say, look yeah. at these young kids coming through today, actually putting pictures, making memories, understanding, yeah. not, not, not preaching to, but just that connection with countryside. It feels great. We're stood here in the middle of the Cotswolds, the sun shining, beautiful part of the world, yeah. looking at animals. It's right. a, it, you know, that in itself is such a valuable thing. And, and I, you know, I don't want it to be evangelical, but that whole thing of putting your tablets away, putting your phone away, you know, watching the birds flying by, identifying the trees, hearing a sheep bleating in the background, a cow mooing, being able to feed them, you know, it gives me a huge amount of pleasure. And I don't know what you were like at school, but I was, I was a bit naughty. <laughs> I guess what I was. <laughs> <laughs> you, were you always in the library? You're quite studious. <laughs> so they used to call me Phil the study vicary. <laughs> So the fun lessons for you, people like you and I, were, you know, the ones we learned at were the ones that were fun. You know, the teacher would tell good stories and, you'd, you know, and then suddenly you'd start learning stuff. And that's what we try and do here. We want people to have a really lovely time and have fun, but then to just go home with a little bit of something in their mind and those memories and just think about it. Let me show you some of our rare breeds. Let's go this way. So are these Albions? Yeah, well spotted. Yeah, so these are one of the newest breeds on the Rare Breed Survival Trust list. And beef and milk or yeah a dual purpose breed like the gloucester okay and uh, and they are very milky and they come from derbyshire so they were known as the bakewell blue and they used to graze a sort of derbyshire hill so really living off just grass converting that into milk and meat and they were known as the bakewell blue but they're now just the breed known as the albion rather than the blue albion because they come white like that yeah. one and they also come black and there's, you know, you mix up the colours and you get the blues and the whites and the blacks. Big frame, aren't they? Like a big, big animal. Yeah, they are. Yes, yeah. so they produce really good quality beef. The great thing about the Albion, like so many of the rare breeds, is that they can live off rough pasture. You don't have to feed them grain or imported soya and palm oil and all those things that we know aren't good for the environment and have come from overseas. They can live off this green stuff. And the great thing about, as you know, we're pasture fed, that green grass is sucking up carbon, so it's yeah. delivering for the environment as well. And these are the creatures, in my mind, that we should be eating. We, always, we had a Hereford bull as kids, like because we had the dairy herd, so we used to cross with, with a Hereford. And it was, it, it's just such a bad boy. He wouldn't get up unless you scratched him. <laughs> you know, useless animal he was, but lo just love the old bull. So tell me the story behind Raging Bull then. Where did that nickname come from for you? I, it all started because I got, I got selected for an England team, midweek team, in the autumn of 97. No, yeah, autumn of 97. And there's a guy playing for New Zealand called Mark Allen. They called him the bull. And the question was asked, how's the young farmer going to get on against the bull? And Clive Woodward said, we've got our own bull, the raging bull. <laughs> and that was it. And that was how it all started. And then I was, I was, by the way, I played and a little bit hectic and... 
you know, I've got, I'll fight you to death tattooed on my arm and things, <laughs> and things like that. So it was a little bit edgy, but then it was, uh, that's how it all started. And then the brand and the clothing, the sports gear, and of course, you know, leisure. And now the brand and what we stand for and what, what we are, it's heritage, you know, honesty, integrity, very much linked to rugby, but actually very much linked to our farming heritage. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's good, it's honest, it's straightforward. There's, there's not much faff around it, yeah. but... I, you know, I love it. It's, it's been incredibly difficult, like anything when you're trying to um, build a new business and trying to create a brand and s sell message. But I'm as people will say to me, it's a bit, I suppose, the same as you. And that people say, don't you, know, don't you, don't you get fed up with saying the same thing? Or I'm as passionate about my brand. I'm as passionate about food, farming, my heritage, where I come from, as a 46-year-old guy today as I was 40 odd years ago. Yeah, so. Yeah. I think we're lucky that we're in, in a space and in a world where lots of good people, lots of things are coming to the fore, and particularly with my brand, when people now are looking at buying things, they want to go to somewhere which they know deliver, be looked after, feel valued. Yes. All those things which we talk about. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I'm incredibly proud and, uh, you know, never been more proud of brand, but never been more proud to actually talk about my heritage and where it is I come from. And great to have life after sport, isn't it? You know, you can easily go from hero to zero. Yeah, no, it's hard, you know. You know, well, listen, in the farming world, as you well know, well-being, mental health, in the sports world, goodness me, it's, it's, it, it is a huge issue. Uh, we're getting better at dealing with it. And even myself, you know, yes, I've had life after and had some things in place and I was always reasonably normal and, uh, you know, started Raging Bull when I was still playing. You know, it, it, it is hard because I, I talk to people, one day you're that hero, and then it's, it's done. You're off the team list. And it's yeah. not like, I say to people, don't, don't you miss playing rugby? And I say, and this is the problem, I say, of course I do. I don't miss training, I don't miss being hurt every day, I don't miss the pain, I don't miss the injuries, I don't miss that. Changing room, I <laughs> Camaraderie. Oh, that bit, ready to go out, big occasion. <laughs> stood in the tunnel, stood on that field. Oh, I miss that. Yeah. <laughs> I miss that. I'd happily walk off then. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do the other bit because that hurts. But, oh, that bit. But, yeah. but that will, will always be the same. And, yeah. uh, and I'd be devastated if it, what, if it wasn't like that. Mm. But I still love the game of rugby. I try and be glass half full rather than half empty. Yeah. It's a wonderful sport. It's it's fantastic community, sense of belonging. Why did I start playing rugby down at Bude Rugby Club? I wanted to represent my town where I came from yeah. and wear that badge with honour. Yeah. That's what I fell in love with and I still feel like that about my game and, and long may that continue. So tell me about your um, brand then with your clothing. Is it just for big fellas like you? Well, it's, it's, for, it's for everyone. I mean, it's for girls and boys. But no, we go down, we've got kids wear as well across the whole section. So if you think about uh, the brand being, um, yes, Raging Bull, yes, we go up bigger sizes up to the 6XL, but actually, if you look around a, a rugby stadium, who do you see? Grandad, unky, uncles, aunties, brothers, sisters, cousins. It is a lifestyle brand, and it's for, you know, it's for everybody. Yeah. All ages, all shapes, all sizes, outerwear, uh, t-shirts, shirts, jackets, you know. So we try and, not all things to all people, but we've gradually grown, taking people with us. We've got some really loyal fans and loyal supporters, keeping those girls and boys happy, but at the same time, you know, bringing in that, 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 that conveyor belt of, you know, the minis, juniors, you know, the rugby playing, yes, community, but it's not just about rugby. It's, it's about those people, families that we all mix around with. And I love it, you know, when I see someone with a Raging Bull shirt on, part of the family, <laughs> part of the family. And I see quite a lot of the Gloucester boys Wearing your yeah, kit. we well, we sponsor their off-field uh, off-field kit, so which is brilliant yeah. for us, yeah. and, and yeah, it works fantastic well. We've also got an outlet in Gloucester as well, Gloucester and Swindon. Got one down in Street in Somerset, up in York, over in um, East Midlands as well. So we're dotted around, yeah. and yeah. on you know online presence, which is really important. And between it all, I still think <laughs> yes, online is the future. Of course it is, but still the connection of people having physical feeling, having those stores, getting that right mix. We're looking at doing more of that. What could that look like? Are we going to do our own standalone stores? All well, gets a bit scary yeah. then. Really. <laughs> but, but you've got to give that sheep some, a handful of nuts. That she's... <laughs> These are Shetland sheep, obviously famous for their beautiful, fine wool, the Shetland jumper. 
And with that, clothing, but, you know, if you don't mind me calling it the rag trade, I mean, quite difficult, isn't it, to, to be ethical and make sure you're doing the right thing? It is, but, but I think, you know, for us, it's constantly looking and striving, uh, looking at factories, looking at what we're doing. But the one thing for me, I think, the difference probably between my brand and what we do than others is we're not throwaway fashion. Yes. You know, we're made well, made too well, I say, because <laughs> it, lasts, it lasts for too long. But I think yeah. there is a serious point to that. We've almost, it's very similar to the food world, actually. We've become a little bit of a throwaway society, whereas we're not about throwaway. We're about buying, you're investing in the brand, you're investing in our quality. Yes, as a supply chain, we look back through, look at looking at factories, what are they doing, looking at their best practice, making sure we can do everything that's in our control, but yeah. actually just treating things as an investment sure, rather yes. than just thinking, oh, I can get rid of it. So uh, that very much fits with me anyway, the same as the food world. Eat, eat something once, but eat something good yeah, yeah. rather than trying and buy six things and actually it doesn't really matter if I don't eat it. Well, it does. So in here, Phil, we've got um, some of your favorites, the Gloucesters. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. God, that was a boy, isn't he? Jeez. He's all right. You give it. You'll let's see if he gives his head in the bucket. Give him a scratch. Talk about a raging bull. There's the two of you. Jeez. <laughs> Although you're both gentle underneath, aren't you? Look at the <laughs> size of that. <laughs> I didn't realise actually. For size-wise, for a native breed, it's a big animal, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he is, yeah. Yeah, he'd be one of the very good bulls in the breed. So this is Clifford Freeman, who's been breeding them for a long time. This is his bull he's lent me to use on our cows. Beautiful mahogany colour in the cows, slightly darker in the bulls. But, you know, you're a Cornish boy born and bred, but then up to Gloucester rugby for a while, now living up here. Are you yeah. more Gloucester or are you more Cornish? Well, I listen, I'll always be Cornish. There's a Celt in me. That's why I'm edgy, look, you see. So I, so I always tell my Welsh friends, I'm more Welsh than you. <laughs> so, it, so it keeps me out of trouble in Wales. But no, I think I moved up here when I was 19, actually, to, to milk on a, a, a dairy farm, milking some cows. I used to train on a Tuesday and a Thursday night, and within a year of me arriving here, they got offered a, the game went professional, and I got offered a professional contract. And 26 years later, you know, Gloucester is my home, and it, we live in such an amazing part of the country. I love Cornwall, the, the, but the beauty of Cornwall is living in Cornwall. And if I was travelling from Cornwall, doing the kind of things as I do now, it wouldn't be any fun. So, what are these sheep, Adam? Yeah, so these are Norfolk horns. So there, um, the Norfolk used to graze the Brecklands of Norfolk, that rough pasture over in Norfolk, and they put a South Down ram onto a Norfolk ewe to produce the Suffolk sheep, which is one of the most popular yeah. rams there is around. And uh, yeah, not lovely sheep. And the, the Gloucester then, so you've got some of these now. Yeah, we've got some, we've got with a friend of mine. Um, actually, where our head office is with Raging Bull, on the farm there, we've got uh, four cows. Have you? We have three calves this year. Great. And uh, yes, yeah, fantastic. But I actually want to. What, what I'm going to, where I'm going to do it is I'm going to send them, send them down to brother. So he's just building up his um, beef herd again. So as I said to him, you know, Gloucester bought the boy out of Cornwall, but now the boy's going to put some Gloucester back in Cornwall. So, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, I'm looking forward to. It. I, I just love the story attached to it as well, like the Gloucesters. You know, and even like now, with being a little bit more involved in it and having it, when I'm going around on my bike and riding, you see so many, you actually realise it's actually quite a popular breed. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and just a kind animal, and I love a story. You know me, I'm like a story, to, you know, <laughs> and I, I love the fact that it's got a bit of history, and you're doing a good job as well. Yes. And we're helping save, and we're helping move forward, and it's a good thing to be doing. You know, why not? Absolutely. Why yeah. not? Well, it's great you feel so passionate about it and you're helping to promote the breed. I love it when people are here, you know, looking at the animals, feeding the animals, being part of it. And then that should link to understanding where their food comes from. Well, as we've already said, and we say it to the cows come home, excuse the pun, the more we can connect people with understanding where food comes from, you can make informed choices. And I think it all starts here, seeing kids, being around animals, looking at what these animals do, how they behave, the connection, storytelling, yeah. that's got to be a good thing for the future. So Gloucester cattle, let me introduce you to our Gloucestershire Old Spot pigs. Come on. <laughs> All right, don't let the sheep out. Look at this. Horny devil, this one, look. Look at the horn on it. Max, Manx Lockton from the Isle of Man. And they have two, four, or sometimes six horns. But what's the why? 
just the way they were. They think they were introduced by the Vikings potentially and um, beautiful wool. So you see it's all sort of pale on the surface. <laughs> <laughs> it's under, underneath, it's a sort of a dark chocolatey colour, same colour as his face. It's absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Right, let's find this pig. So here she is. Gorgeous pigs. And with these floppy ears, they reckon that they're more docile. You know, and a pig with upright ears is sort of all alert. With their floppy ears, they seem to be more docile, been handled for you know, a long, long time as a breed. And docility is a really important. And of course, they used to graze the apple orchards. And the old wives' tale is, of course, that's where they got the black spots from the falling apples. But if you believe that, <laughs> believe that, <laughs> uh, You can sell a story, but I'm, I'm even struggling with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and produce beautiful pork and, and bacon. Really lovely pigs. And why did we go away from this traditional breed then? Is it just purely based on size and carcass size? It was really. We were trying to have a fast growing, leaner pig indoor production post-war you know 70s 80s and these slow growing pigs didn't really suit indoor production and also interestingly with the pork and particularly if you have a roasting joint they didn't want any color in oh, their skin because it comes through in the crackling and so um they wanted white pigs <laughs> they're great aren't they <laughs> testing out the testing out the raisin bull jeans <laughs> <laughs> that's quality for you Hey, look at that. Devils. They're just lovely, aren't hey, they? You can just you watch piglets all day long. Hey, you devils. So with our rare breeds of pigs on the Cotswold Farm Park, we keep them with their mother until they're about eight weeks old in a commercial indoor system. They take them off at three weeks old. Three weeks? Yeah, but we let them stay with their mothers until they're sort of eight, ten weeks. And then they go to a local farm where they're reared and then made into bacon and sausages and pork. Well, I suppose with them being outside for longer as well, they're building up natural uh, resistance. Yeah. They're building their own immune systems, yeah. healthier, and just, just a better standard of life. Well, and muscle, you know, they're, that, their meat, although it, they're burning energy, so they grow slower, but they're actually got some really good yeah. muscle on them. You know, natural growth, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's so naughty. Right. But it's interesting, like with the, with the old spot, because it's, we've fallen back in love with that. I did a, a, a cook at someone's house Oh, it wasn't last year, it was pre-COVID, so God give us me three years ago. I took some Gloucester Old Spot, a side of Gloucester Old Spot, and they were like, oh my God, this is amazing. I said, but you can buy this. <laughs> yeah. I haven't found it, you can get this. Yes. And I think going back to that occasion, thinking about what it is you're buying in food, if you're going to do it, do it really well. Yeah. Find a really well made or really well produced, if it's an animal meat, meat protein or whatever it is, but actually all those things have become so accessible for us now. Yes, indeed. And it is about buying food, not just to fill ourselves up, but you know, thinking about your nutrition, thinking about health and well-being, and having, you know, if it's a little bit more expensive, just have it as a treat. Don't eat it every day of the week. When you think about what we've talked about, you know, our grandparents and, 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 and had all these things and talked about all the things which we're talking about today back then. How, where food comes from, thinking about your meal, having something nicer, but making it be a free meal event. Yeah. And actually when you start planning and talking about food, because it's one of my frustrations with my cooking sort of chefy head hat on, it's kind of, when was the last time you actually sat down and planned? People say, I don't have time, or I can't afford. Sit down and plan your week, and you'd be amazed yeah. how simple that is. Yeah. But no, because we're always thinking about throwaway, last minute, oh, I haven't got time. Make time for food. Yeah, indeed. Make time to eat. Yeah. Make time. It's good for you. It's the biggest impact you can have on you is what <laughs> yeah. we put in us. Yeah. Make time for it. You've seen the Gloucester Old Spot. You've seen the Gloucester Cattle. Our third county breed, the Cotswold Sheep. All of our livestock go back to lay back grazing. So when dad created the farm park, they had quite big fields, but of course they'll move away and go and lie in the shade under the trees and all the rest of it. So we built the paddock so they're slightly smaller to bring them over to the public. Um, and then we turn them back to lay back grazing at night. So the lovely Cotswold sheep, beautiful wool, you know, made the Cotswolds what they are today. And uh, so they say a, a cot is an enclosure, wold rolling hill. So there were thousands of these sheep on the Cotswolds and it was the wool they were after. That's the gold. That's the gold. So that's where the value is. Um, but also it has, when they have a full fleece on them, obviously they weren't, they've recently been shorn, long, lustrous, golden coloured wool. And um, 
quite a big sheep. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's got, again, a big frame. It's mm. a little bit like the native breeds. They're, they're, they're strong, aren't they? They're they hardy. Are. They're big framed mm. animals. And they leave them with these dreadlocks on because in the olden days, that's done by tradition, they were buying sheep for their wool, really. And to be able to tell the quality of their fleece, they had to look at a bit. Look at, the, look at the, what was already there. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. And they used to sometimes leave a bit on their shoulder as well. And they produce a really good quality lamb, so they're nice eating. But all of our wool, to try and add value to it, goes to Harrison Spinks up in Yorkshire, where they make a range of mattresses for me. And I buy Cotswold wool from all the Cotswold breeders, all the pedigree Cotswold breeders, pay them a really good price for their wool to add value to what they're doing. And then that all goes up to Yorkshire into these mattresses. And wool being, you know, springy, hard wearing, resilient, regulates the temperature, but also naturally fire retardant, is just wonderful mm. in a mattress. And do the same traits apply to the sheep as the cattle as, as far as low maintenance? They look after themselves, you don't have to feed proteins, you don't have to bring a lot in, is it the same? It is really, with a lot of these native breeds. The smaller breeds, the primitive animals like the Shetland and the Soe, um, the Castle Milk Moret, the Manx with the four horns, yeah. they're much easier to look after, so very low maintenance. Cotswolds and the larger breeds, slightly more maintenance, but they're still self-sufficient. They can look after themselves. They lamb easily, they're good mothers, they produce brilliant milk, yeah, and just a lovely, practical, you know, decent-sized sheep. Probably time you had some British wool products in your Raging Bull brand. Well, could you imagine some, some Cotswold sheep, some Cotswold wool with a Raging Bull? I'd, I'd love to, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out either. That can be something for the future. Something you can help me with, Adam. <laughs> so a lot of our British breeds, the, the wool is slightly coarser, and so nice in suits and jackets and those things, but not so good close to the skin. So if you've got those wicking, you know, sportswear, um, a lot of people are using wool now, but it's generally the merino that comes from Australia. Yeah, yeah. But our wool is great in carpets and rugs and in tweedy type, type jackets. Yeah, I think. Wonder if you, you could design, I could have the Adam Henson outerwear range, <laughs> Raging Bull. How about that? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> we might be starting something here. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, we're also finishing it here as well. <laughs> I'm obviously a big fan of wool, but a lot of your garments would be cotton how do you go about sourcing that well i think we use best practice i mean we've got uh, we use organic cotton in some of our range as well which is a massive development for us but i think as a business as me so me as phil vickery forget raging bull the impact now on environment and certainly water usage particularly with uh, cotton which is very much at the forefront i think we're very much aware of that uh, when we look at factories we look at best practice what are you doing are you adhering to all regulations I don't stand there saying that we, we're, we're perfect, but constantly looking at how I can. But I go back to the original point for me where I believe my Raging Bull Top for me is an investment, but not a throwaway brand. Mm. So it doesn't justify, ultimately, we've got to take responsibility for when we purchase, the same as whether we're purchasing food or whatever it may be. But we are trying to do the best we can do yes. uh, in all ways. And I think that is going to be constantly evolving, constantly moving, and the world is constantly changing as well. And I think we do that in farming. We don't get it all right all the time, but as long as we're conscious of it and we're trying to do the right thing and moving in the right direction, because it's pointless saying, oh yeah, we're brilliant, because you can get, you know, struck down because you're not in some areas so i think that's exactly the right thing to do you know you just want to try your very best and go on that journey steps at a time but i've always said you know i think responsibly yes as us as businesses but also us as consumers you know we all need to take responsibility we're on a journey at raging bull and we're looking at sourcing we're looking at cotton production where we're looking at well-being looking at factories welfare but actually we need to as consumers take some responsibility you know are we buying too much do we really need that it's got to be the whole circle we all need to take responsibility not just point the finger at people and go what are you doing well actually what are you doing yeah sure the impact yeah. that you can have and go on that journey to do the right thing when you can yeah not about being perfect we know we're not perfect but just to be the best we can and constantly looking to evolve, looking at best practice and actually looking at what's going on in the world and just being open-minded to that. Yeah. So that's the walkway with all of our different rare breeds. But then we've got lots of play. So they're having fun, you know, pedal tractors. And then we've got all the barns with them being able to handle animals and get up close to animals. We lamb our ewes in front of the public. All that just getting up close and getting hands on, I love. 
I suppose when people arrive here, yes, you come in and see the animals, you want, you want the, the, that experience getting back to nature, but actually having fun, being in an environment where you can get rid of energy, but actually spend half a day or a day with your family, what a fantastic opportunity yeah. here in this beautiful space, surrounded by great things, going home and creating memories. Yeah, indeed. So with the farm park, what we've done now, we've got a field attached to it that we're growing things. And uh, I'd like to show you our potato patch. So this is our events field, Phil, just an extension to the Cotswold Farm Park. And we've tried growing various things in here over the years. So we've got sunflowers that will soon be in full bloom. <laughs> we're hoping they'll hurry up. <laughs> that looks stunning and people just love to come and have their photographs taken with them. And then we cut the sunflowers and they get to buy some to take home. But then also we've got these wildlife margins all around the farm. And this is an example of what we can do on the wider farm round the outside of our arable fields. So great for the pollinators, the bees, the butterflies, the insects. And it just looks absolutely stunning. Oh, it's beautiful. So it's creating spaces and you, your commercial, commercial arable farmer, but the way that you can actually reintroduce wild spaces for animals, bees, insects, to incorporate it into the bigger picture. And I actually, just standing here looking at it, it looks beautiful as well, doesn't it? It really does. So people love to come and have a selfie and you know, sit next to it and just take some time and soak it all up. And I think that's important, us getting into the great outdoors, you know, and that whole health and well-being thing. But also with commercial farming, producing very, very good quality food using technology and precision farming, with all the standards and regulation in place, but also looking after the environment like our fathers and grandfathers would have done. Balance, and using knowledge which we've already got in simple ways to make sure you're giving back, giving opportunity, looking after our countryside, because ultimately you're a farmer, you're a steward of our countryside, and we need to look after it for future generations. And I think that balance of which you've got here, for me, is a great example of what the future of farming is about. Indeed. And a lot of farmers now planting these wildlife margins, going back to pollen nectar mixes, having beautiful flower meadows. So what we're growing here is a number of different plots of purebred flowers, so just one sort, although there is a couple of sorts in here. <laughs> yeah. And then what we'll do is we're working with bright seeds. So they come to flower, produce the seed, and then we'll harvest these with a little combine harvester. And then this seed is sold onto other farms around the country so they can create wildflower meadows and these margins. And then over here, Cornish favorite, we got some potatoes. <laughs> Did you have potatoes on the farm as a no, boy? No, we did. I, it, sadly, it, it, great memories, but also memories of uh, a lot of hard work because <laughs> I can remember them being chucked out the back of the potato hovers, riddled out on the floor, kids, all hands to pumps, buckets, picking up potatoes into fertilizer bags, loading them up, weaking them on the trailer, into the potato shed. But my, my grandfather actually hand rubbed every single potato on farm in those potato bags, wow. 25 kilo bags, every single one. Incredible. So for you, following your incredible career in rugby, then into MasterChef and just about pipping Matt Dawson. Listen, I was always better than Matt Dawson, not just on the rugby field, but off the field as well. And when it came to MasterChef, I was far better than him. <laughs> I threatened him with a cook-off and he never, ever come back to me about it because he knows. But the, the serious point though, I think my passion for food and, and doing MasterChef, I love food, I love cooking. I'm not a chef, but I love food. And when I went on the show, crazily enough, I didn't go on to win it. I just go on, don't get knocked out first, because then there's no, you, you, you know, you can't get ridiculed too much. But then you get involved in it, you start connecting with food, being in restaurant camaraderie, being in the kitchen, and falling in love with something which I've always enjoyed. Yeah, sure. And, and being part of that and being able to help promote and the, the, the MasterChef family, the whole show, the girls and boys on it, the production team, the lighting, the soundies, it's like a real big family and truly, truly one of the best things that I've ever done. And then went back to judge. Yeah, no, judging bits. I get nervous for them when I'm judging. <laughs> the only thing is with judging, which I learn, and uh, you've got to say what you think. I always try and be glass half full rather than half empty. But when you see people walking through the door and shaking with nerves, 
it brings back all those emotions and you feel, <laughs> I feel so sorry for them. But I just think, I just hope this food tastes nice. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were in the World Cup winning team when we beat Australia. When was that? 2003? Three, yeah. It'll be 20 years next year. Wow, incredible. But you get nervous for the contributors of MasterChef. But the thing is, you know what you know. The thing is, when you're in, you're in an uncomfortable environment, and the nerves, the pressures, when that clock starts and you've got one hour and you have to go and it's got to be ready and you don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I did the invention test and I'm thinking, right, what have we got? If you can practice and look back at past shows and think, goodness me, I've got that. I lifted my box up, I had loads of vegetables and a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just kind of crazy. So my brain straight away is going, right, vegetables such and such so i'm thinking stews casserole can use that herb stock and then john Thoreau goes you have 45 minutes to create one ditch dish but it has to include the squirrel <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you know? yeah. so the thing is when you're judging you know the kind of pressures that they've been under and you know you feel from at the same time you know i want people to do well yeah. i don't like seeing people fail and now you've opened your own restaurant, number three, because yeah. of presumably the number on the back of your shirt. Yeah, number three is my shirt number. And uh, yeah, we've had it. It's been fantastic. I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been very difficult as for, for everyone, but particularly hospitality in the past couple of years. But we're very authentic. We're food led. Uh, we're real people doing real things, independent business, trying to do good stuff. And one of the lovely things about the terrible tragedy which has happened as far as the uh, covid it's actually made people really think about where they spend their money mm -hmm. and that seeing people and the support which we've received has been fantastic and i've loved i love meeting people i love talking we've shared some great memories already and i think we do a really really good job so we do this not obviously on a commercial scale just really to try and take the next step to encouraging people to understand where their food comes from. So what they do is they come to the entrance, they get a little wheelbarrow, they get a fork, they get a brown paper bag, and they come out here awesome. to dig their own potatoes. And it was fascinating. Last year, there was a, a, a bunch of young women and they were in their white trainers and their white jeans. And they said, we've come to get some potatoes. So I gave them a wheelbarrow and the bag and they came out here and they said, where are they? <laughs> and I said, you've got to dig. You've got to dig for them. And so they started digging and this, they found one. And this girl went down on one knee and she, oh, I've got, got one. one. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic in one way, but quite sad in another that although she had probably eaten lots of roast potatoes and chips and had mash and crisps and all that, she actually didn't know that potatoes came from under the ground. What this ignites for me, we were very lucky growing up as kids because actually we all had our own little gardens on the farm. And we didn't have any rules. My, my grand, my nan and granddad were historically, they used to grow, they were market gardeners. Uh, so it was always about produce and the joy of pulling up yeah. a potato head and seeing your veg as kids. God, you know, I feel so lucky to have had that. And I think there's only a very small percentage of the population who have picked and dug something and eaten it themselves, taken a berry off a bush or an apple off a tree. And, and that's a shame. We've just got to try and get reconnected with our food. Well, Phil, thanks for coming along today. It's been great to spend some time with you. And good luck with the clothing brand and your restaurant. I thought I'd just uh, introduce you to my beer. This is uh, Adam Henson's Rare Breed. So we grow Marisotta malting barley on the farm, and it's a sort of Rolls-Royce of malt, and they use it in this rare breed produced by Buck and Brewery. And uh, interesting to see with your foodie head on. What do you think? Mm. This is, where I have, this is where I have to say it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Tastes delicious, nice and crisp, with a gentle simmering finish. Very non-offensive. <laughs> I use the word delicious, actually. No, it's really nice. But I think, seriously, Adam, it's always lovely to come and see you because you're a good man. But I think what you are, really, this kind of sums up for me. You're a commercial arable uh, farmer, but actually you're not. It's so much more. The work you're doing here, you're invigorating, you're educating next generations, you're thinking about wildlife, we're thinking about our countryside, and to think here, this is a commercial brewery making award-winning drinks, but knowing that a little bit of this farm's in there. Well done, buddy. I'm Cheers. proud of you. Good to see you.